So I am Michael Swisher. I am with the Department of Human Services in the Child and Family Services Division, and I'm the host for our webinar today. This is actually part of a series we've been doing. So um, <laughs> I got just got a note. So I can change that for you, but I'm going to keep going here. Scotty wants to actually be rewritten. I'll do that. But let me tell you a little bit about us that um, this is actually a series we've been doing around community and parenting support. We've been doing this since COVID hit and just trying to offer some extra help and useful information to parents and families and people across the community. Uh, we've kept it going because of its success and the demand. People, are, people keep showing up. So in addition to providing skills and tips, we also hope that people can build connections through this. So. You know, we're all part of this community, whether we're Zooming or walking up and down the street together. So the pandemic pandemic can need to be tough for all of us. Together, we can get through it. So this will be short and sweet. We Total time is an hour. Uh, we actually have two different presentations we'll be bringing to you. And so stop in between. So um, a couple of minutes after each presentation for some Q&A. And we invite you to offer questions and thoughts and anything through the chat. We do have someone staffing the chat. That's Courtney Martin, my friend and colleague with the Prevention Unit. Um, I'll introduce our presenters in a moment. I want to make sure that Courtney, you know that Courtney's there. And so we're there to take any questions or anything. We do invite you to let us know a little about yourself. One of the things we'd like to know is where you live in Arlington, what's your zip code, um, if you have children, what school they're in, and if you want to give us grades, that'd be awesome too. Just to have a sense of who, or if there's no, if you don't have any kids in the school, and you're just like, nope, I'm just a parent or person here. So, um, so our focus is really overall managing stress, and there's been a lot of that over time that we've all lived with, um, and that there's also holiday stress that's a regular thing, and so this is kind of bringing both of those together. Uh, how we can manage all that. Our first presenter is Jacob Stein. And Jacob is from around the area, growing up in Bethesda, Maryland. He graduated from Beloit College um, at the beginning of COVID pandemic in May of 2020 with a bachelor's in psychology and French. Since then, he has been working on a master's of social work at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. Jacob is currently working at Yorktown High School and hopes to continue working in schools to advocate for and provide mental health care and resources to students. So welcome, Jacob, I'm gonna hand off to you. I did say Jacob, but just kind of swallow the last part. And All right, well, let me just share my screen real quick and get my notes up. The speaker notes, I cannot see them. Presentation. Um... Okay. Just gonna move y'all a little bit out of the way. All right, so let's get right into it. Um, so surviving the pandemic, the impact of COVID on our students. Uh, there were a lot of them. Whew. So we're just gonna start this with a grounding exercise. I like uh, this particular one, five, four, three, two, one. Um, just to kind of center ourselves and prepare ourselves because this topic, it's not the heaviest topic on the, in the world, but it's definitely, a special topic. So uh, we're going to start with five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. You're free to share your answers in the chat. Uh, you're free to note them to yourself. We're just going to take a couple minutes to do that. Um, and so I guess I guess I'll go first. Um, five things I can see. I can see the uh, whiteboard behind me, the cross up there, as I am at the Catholic University. Um, there is the desk that I'm sitting at. Um, there is the computer in front of me and there is my phone, which has my notes on it for this presentation. As far as things I can touch, the desk, the computer, the phone again, um, this uh, computer next to me, whiteboard behind me, which is a little bit farther away, and my glasses. Oh, and we can just let that person in. There we go. All right, if you're just joining us now, we're just doing a grounding exercise at the theme of the presentation. Um, so uh, going back, two things I can smell. Um, smell this classroom and a hand sanitizer next to me. And uh, one thing I can taste is the mint I had earlier. Uh, if anyone wants to share, now's the time. If not, we can push forward. 
Allez, Wally. Okay, cool. I guess we'll just post on then. All right. So, um, COVID and mental health of our students. Um, with the new normal of COVID comes new uh, new anxiety for them. There's anxiety about the future. There's uh, There's been anxiety about the future for a while now with all the current events we have going on, global warming, the pandemic just adds to that stress. Um, technology obviously leads to constant exposure to uh, COVID and news. Uh, you have your phones, you have Instagram, Twitter, social medias, CNN, you know, all the internet, all the uh, news feeds. And those are constantly on our phones. We're constantly getting notifications. We're constantly getting bombarded with this news. And so it's hard. It's almost impossible to avoid. Um, with the rise of social media, we've also had the rise of cyberbullying. Um, students going on their phones, going on social media and creating anonymous accounts. It's harder to curb as if a student's account gets banned, we can, they just make a new one and it's hard to track them because a lot of times they're anonymous. Uh, depression and anxiety are on the rise um, as reported by a lot of studies right now. A uh, study done by the Surgeon General recently, the Surgeon General released a advisory on mental health and the mental health crisis in our youth uh, a few weeks back. And uh, it found that depression and anxiety symptoms doubled during the pandemic. Um, but the pandemic is just one thing. It's just the current thing going on right now. As we go on, things, other stressful events will come and the stress of that future adds up. During the pandemic, the course of the pandemic, 30% of adults sought out mental health care. Um, that number has continued. 30% of adults are now in therapy. And there's actually almost a shortage of therapists. Uh, most, most colleagues that I know of and a lot of people I've talked to have mentioned there's a huge waiting list when it comes to uh, therapy or any type of mental health care right now. With the advent of telehealth care, it's becoming a little bit easier to do, but at the same time, there are still, still a little bit overwhelmed. So if adults are this overwhelmed, uh, they have overwhelmed by lost jobs, lost family and friends, overturning their social norms. When it comes to our students, they're no strangers to it either. Um, when you have a loss of a family member or a loss of a friend, um, that stress adds up very fast. Um, the pandemic quite literally turned everyone's lives upside down. So what about our students? If adults are that stressed, what about our students? Well, our students are not blind. As I mentioned, we're all bombarded by social media. Our students are no, they are no different. Oh, I do not know what happened there. I'm sorry. Let me just go back there. Um, as far as our students, uh, they're not blind to what's going on. They are very hyper aware of what's going on in the pandemic. Um, a survey done in Milwaukee shows that Eight through 12th graders should profound knowledge of the pandemic, the virus itself, and the safety measures implemented to combat it. They know they're following it. They know what's going on. They know that it's a scary virus. They know that there's methods to combat it. They know that our future isn't changing anytime soon. We're going to probably have to live with this disease. And they know they're keeping abreast of what Fauci's saying. They're keeping abreast of everything. Um, as far as the switch, they had to make a very stressful switch. They had to go from in-person school, everything they knew, to an online school, a new modality that they had not, they knew nothing about. Um, with a new environment, came new distractions. Uh, you have students doing work from their bedrooms. So obviously students that game or play video games, they a lot of times would be gaming during the, uh, oh, that's someone asking questions. Sorry about that. They would actually be playing games during class or they would be doing something else in their room during class. They'd have their cameras off. They would have their, they'd be muted. Um, it was challenging to do work. Um, learning difficulties were exacerbated. Students that normally had learning uh, accommodations such as 504s or IEPs, accommodations of extended time and support uh, had challenges as the support had to find new modalities to help them out. They could not get the traditional support they were used to. And so they kind of struggled a lot. Um, of course, it goes without saying there's a sense of isolation. Everyone was kind of isolated from their friends. They could see them online, but they couldn't see them in person. And so that led to a profound sense of isolation. Um, but now we have had the opposite. Students are going back into school. They are going back in person and we're finding a whole host of new challenges from that, from going, getting used to Zoom school to going back. It's a big change. So what is school like in the COVID era? Well, for starters, uh, a lot of students missed developmental and social milestones. A lot of students missed out on prom. They missed out on graduation. And um, a lot of students and teachers, about, of younger students are reporting that students are having a lot of trouble socializing right now. The isolation definitely had an effect on that, profound effect. Um, sense of time can be work for a lot of students. Uh, there was a two-year jump. So students that left 
uh, high school as uh, juniors. They thought they were going away for two weeks and now they are uh, high school freshmen. As for seniors, seniors left for two weeks and were thrust into college. Uh, they are now sophomores and they were thrust into college in the Zoom era. So in a new modality, a new place, new people. And now that we're kind of catching up, a lot of students have a sense of being left behind. They think partially, oh, maybe I'll go, I'll, I'll end up back. Maybe I'll end up back in school. Maybe go back to prom, go back to graduation. But in reality, they know that's not true. Um, as with the pandemic, we have new regulations put in place to protect the health of the students. Um, mass mandate, most students are vaccinated. Um, younger students at the beginning certainly had a little bit of trouble at hearing. Um, I've heard stories of uh, students that had a Captain America mask and another student that had an Iron Man mask and they traded and that held its own host of challenges. Um, older students still have trouble at hearing sometimes. Uh, a lot of times in the hallways, you'll see students, their masks will fall below their nose and they'll forget. And so we'll have to remind them a couple of times here and there. Um, you have uh, students missing school as well. Um, one of the regulations right now is that if you exhibit any symptoms, you have to get a COVID test. And so students that don't have COVID have to stay out of school and wait till they get a result before they can go back. Uh, as far as impact on behavior, um, I'm sure many parents have be became teachers at the dining room table um, while their kids were in Zoom school. And so during Zoom school, uh, a new set of kind of behaviors were, were, were developed. Um, when you have uh, your own individual life and you're managing your schoolwork yourself in your room, in your bedroom, and you're working from home, you have more independence. Um, students are now having to reacclimate to authority and kind of listening to teachers and teachers are having to reclaim that authority in classrooms. A lot of times students are less receptive to it as when you're working from home in your bedroom, you're your own boss, you tell yourself what to do. Um, your parents are telling you what to do, but your parents are always telling you what to do. So that change is definitely being seen in schools. We're definitely seeing students struggling with that. Um, students are most likely to take, uh, at least in the New York town, they're likely to take long bathroom breaks or skip class altogether. Um, sometimes we'll see students in groups wandering the hallways, um, clearly not on the bathroom break. Um, many schools in our Arlington County have an competitive environment, and that was true before the pandemic as well. Um, APs, honors classes, all of the rigorous classes uh, of Arlington County. And now that we're back, students that were high achievers and students that even weren't high achievers are going back to those classes. And they're finding it harder to achieve those classes because during the pandemic, they lost a lot of their their um they lost a lot of their focus they had a lot of trouble focusing and they had a lot of trouble kind of keeping on top of their work and so their drive to work is lower it's still there they still want to succeed they want to do all these complicated classes but the motivation and the work ethic isn't there like it used to be students push themselves as hard as they could before the pandemic um now but it's not always sustainable for them um, they're trying to ignore the facts of the pandemic, even though they're raising on and without acknowledging the fact it's becoming harder. Um, as I mentioned before, there was a time warp um, from junior year into college. Uh, you have, again, students that left senior year and were thrust into college immediately. They missed out on graduation. The new modality of learning was thrust on them in school. They started Zoom school at the end of high school and they went to college their first year in Zoom school. And so adjusting to that and adjusting to college was a massive change. College is completely different than than uh, than high school. It's a completely different ball game, completely different set of expectations, and so holding themselves accountable has definitely been a challenge to a lot of college students that I've talked to as well. Um, graduating and under in undergrad in the pandemic, a lot of students, um, especially from my undergrad program in 2020, um, when talking to them, a lot of them still had this feeling of we left school in 2020 in the height of a pandemic, and we're still secretly waiting to go back we're still waiting for everything to go back to normal to go back to our classes to go back to our dorms and graduate like normal but again that's not going to happen because two years have passed since then and so there's this sense of disconnect between where they are now and where they think they should be so um the term new normal i'm sure none of us are strangers to it um the pandemic has turned everything upside down we are all currently adjusting to this sense of new normal our students parents um, staff, everyone is trying to figure out how to exist in this new world that we have now. Um, now more than ever, we need mental health care in our schools, um, particularly for our students who are stressed about the future. 
thankfully, uh, Arlington County has the resources to provide uh, this care to students. Um, but it's also important to for the students to maintain a sense of uh, social support um, and mental health, specifically in social work. We're a big proponent of the uh, person and environment and strength based perspective. And one of the strengths based one of those things that we adhere to is the student's social network. Their social support network is one of the strongest predictors for a positive outcome. And um, the parents are part of that social network. They're part of the support network. And so maintaining a relationship with your student is imperative for them to have a good mental health outcome, health outcome especially right now. Um, during the pandemic, and now there's a sense of burnout, um, the pandemic brought the advent of work from home. Uh, as mentioned before many times, the students were working from their bedrooms. Uh, college students alike were also working from their bedrooms, often from their parents' houses, and adults as well were working from their rooms, their off home offices. And so with this work from home came this idea of no separation between work and home. The space you exist in, the space you relax in, the space you find comfort in and eat and hang out with the people that live in your house became also your workspace. And so there's a lot of examples of people overworking themselves. It's high burnout because people will get up later because they're home and they'll end up working later, but there won't be a separation of, oh, I can clock out now, I can go home because they're already home. So they'll work late, very late hours that aren't necessary. This is particularly evident in college students. Um, college students, you know, you go to class, you go back to your dorm, you have a separation between the library and classes and all those things. Um, but when you're, you're at home with your parents, you lose, completely lose that sense of independence. Um, it feels like a regression almost. You are stuck in your parents' house. You can't go anywhere because the pandemic was raging. You're in your room most of the time and you're doing work from that room. So there's no sense of separation between that. Um, again, students at Yorktown are loading their schedule with challenging AP classes and other courses. It can be overwhelming, especially when it's very challenging to do work in your room. With that lack of separation, comes a struggle to focus in that space as the space is kind of not allocated for something. It's allocated for all the things at once. And so finding a balance between doing work in that space and relaxing in that space becomes challenging. Um, furthermore, the presence of a global pandemic in our everyday lives is stressful, it's traumatic. Hearing about it on the days on the news every day can lead to burnout. You don't wanna look at the news, you don't wanna look at social media feeds because all you see is negative information. Um, Besides burnout, we also have a sense of, oh, sorry, we also have a sense of isolation. Um, of course, the health measures brought about by the pandemic brought a sense of isolation, you know, six feet apart, masks, you cannot see the person and you couldn't really be close to them. So it was a big sense of isolation. A lot of times, um, a lot of students connected with each other on the internet, on social media apps, on games, on whatever method they could. but important to remember that though students might be hanging out with their friends online every single day or talking to them all the time, it does not equate to in-person interaction. It's not the same and it still leads to a sense of isolation. You could talk to your friends all day long on the pandemic from sunrise to sunset and it's still not the same as seeing them in person. It's still not the same as talking to them, seeing their faces, being outside of your house. It's a big change. Um, even over mental health services during the pandemic, you had this problem of uh, not seeing your therapist. It's harder to practice um, via, via Zoom or via telehealth. Uh, I know it's been a struggle for a lot of social workers and a lot of mental health professionals to try to figure out how to give therapy or how to give mental health care in this new space. Um, even now with the pandemic measures being repealed a little bit, a lot of people still go to telehealth or still are giving care through telehealth. And so there's this new space that exists now. And so it's very different. Um, there's also reduced interaction between family members. Even if you live in the same house as your parents, you might not see your extended family or cousins or people that live in the area. You couldn't go see family members if they got sick far away. Um, if you're, God forbid, someone in your house got sick, you couldn't see them either if they got hospitalized because you couldn't risk it. So this profound sense of isolation still remains for a lot of students. A lot of students left school. They left middle school and came to high school. And some of them left behind their friends as they did not go to the same middle school. I'm in the same high school as them. They are struggling with making new friends and existing in these new environments with people they don't know because all of their friends are in a different school and they left them behind when they were in eighth grade and now they are uh, sophomores and they're still struggling. So the sense of isolation still exists even though we're somewhat returning to this new normal. Um, just some narratives from students. Um, 
uh, from students I've talked to, college students, uh, classmates from Catholic. Um, one student definitely mentioned that uh, he felt like his attention span had decreased after the pandemic. It was harder to sit down and do work and just do it, just knock it out. It's hard, much harder to do. You have students that are not, that are driven to do what they want to do. They want to succeed. They want to be, pa they're passionate about what they care about. They want to do well in these courses, but they don't have the drive to get the grades or do work because they feel like nothing matters. Um, speaking to the sense of uh, time warp, you have uh, people that left as seniors and they went to college and they know no one. They, even if they did go to Zoom school, they didn't meet anyone because they were all on Zoom. I know that this semester specifically uh, was the first time that I saw 95% of my classmates in person. I knew them only from a Zoom screen. Um, again, speaking to doing work in the room, that is becoming a challenge for everyone. <clears throat> so what can you do? Well, there's a lot of different things you can do. For starters, restorative practice is important. Effective communication between you and your student or the people around you is very important, especially right now. Um, practicing more restorative practices and focusing less on punishment and more understanding. Um, understanding what is going on, understanding the mental health crisis, understanding what our students are going through right now is imperative to helping them and supporting them and making their, I guess, the holiday season a, a good experience for them. Um, it's not a normal year, uh, even though things have returned to normal, have returned to a sense of normalcy. It's not a normal year for these students. These students are returning to school with masks and it's not the same as it was when they left uh, two years back. Um, working to understand your students' issues and what's going on in their lives is just demonstrates to them that you care and that you want to help. Um, beyond that, uh, behavior modeling is super important, showing them that you have good self-care practices, showing them that you also use restorative practices and modeling that behavior for them makes them more likely to repeat that behavior, to take it into themselves and work on it. Um, your student learns from you and mirrors your behavior. And so, the best thing you can do is model good behavior. Um, if your student takes to you taking, taking care of yourself, they're likely to take care of themselves as well, or even come to you and ask you how you take care of yourself. So uh, Madeline's gonna touch a lot more on self-care and how we can do that, but just some quick self-care, uh, somewhat obvious things, um, eating well, key to healthy, key to healthy life, key to healthy mental health. Um, recent research in the last few years have revealed the gut-brain axis. The gut-brain axis shows that our gut is directly linked to our mental health. If you have poor gut health and digestive health, you're more likely to have poor mental health and vice versa. So eating healthy is especially important now that we know this. Um, sleep, sleep, you cannot stress it enough. Sleep is incredibly important to your student's life, to your life. So just keeping yourself healthy, keeping yourself ready to go, keeping yourself having enough energy to do things during the day. Um, teaching your student how to set healthy boundaries. Um, you may set boundaries with your student already, but it's also important to know that they can also set boundaries with you. And respecting those boundaries and teaching them how to, how to kind of exist in those boundaries and how to set them and, and respect them is very important to their development. Um, and especially during the holidays, space might be important as well. Um, knowing that to know, for them, knowing, that to, knowing when to say no um, and not overwhelm themselves is very important. Um, a productive skills such as cooking or um, stitching. I know some uh, students reported that their, their mother was teaching them how to knit. Um, productive skills gives them a way to cope. And giving your students space. Um, the lot, over the last couple of years, students have been home, isolating their homes a lot, and they've been around their families a lot. And space to themselves as they grow is important. Students will want to do things to themselves. They want, to, they want time to themselves. They want time to reflect, to relax by themselves and not be around people all the time. And it's important to give them that sometimes. Um, but yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, this is the list of sources that I've used. Um, thank you so much for your time. Now we can open it up to questions as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate all that you shared. It's interesting. I schooler and a college student and so hearing some of what you're saying is like giving me a little more perspective on what they're living i mean i kind mm -hmm. of see it and get it but it's really nice to hear like especially someone who's in in there <laughs> as you are <laughs> um so it, it's it was it was eye-opening um, thank you 
certainly doesn't make it any easier for them or us. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we have a few minutes. If there are any questions, um, I typically do like a count up to nine. So feel free to come off my or come off mute. Throw something in the chat. Um, and if there's no questions, that's okay too. I just wanted to say good job. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know if we were allowed to clap, but <laughs> I was talking by myself, so I thought of it. So someone came in iPhone. It looks like you came off mute. Do you want? To, do you have something to say? Yeah. So is there? A, you know, I've heard everything you said. I got a phone call, and and answered the phone, and then had to reconnect back. Uh, so is there a solution? Is there a solution to the new norm? <laughs> Well, I mean, I didn't hear that part. I must have been. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 it was like a build up. You were building up to a point. Mm -hmm. You talked about therapy and, and, and the difficulty in getting therapy now because there's so many people that need it. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be a solution somewhere or there's got to be an outlet. What is your take on that? Well, um, so there's no end all be all solution for this. I mean, all of us are still learning how to exist in this new norm, but there are things you can do um, to help your student out, help out um, for starters, restorative practices, moving from less, moving from a place of understanding instead of punishment. So if something if your student like is behind on an assignment, for example, right, or lashes out, instead of immediately being like, go to your room, you're grounded, punish. No, it's more like, okay, well, why did that happen? What is going on? What is what is the root cause behind that? So that's like restorative practices. Uh, moving away from, un moving towards understanding is very helpful for your student. It shows them that you care. It shows them that you want to understand, you want to support them. Um, understanding, especially right now, is very key to the mental health crisis uh, that's going on in youth. And then behavior modeling. The other thing you can do that's really important is showing your student or your child um, good behavior and good self-care uh, behaviors and showing them how to take care of themselves by taking care of yourself because you can't help you can't take care of anyone if you're not taking care of yourself so by taking care of yourself and showing your student that you can take care of yourself um, it shows them how, in a way how to take care of themselves and that it's just how to cope in general uh, and then Madeline will be going over other uh, coping mechanisms as well and self-care during this uh, holiday season I'll jump in and add one more thing because I put it in the chat um, and the first page it shows up is in Spanish. It's a bilingual flyer of youth mental health resources. So a lot of what Jacob is saying is uh, how can we hold hold steady and mm -hmm. that can be great if you can't hold steady or if you've got a young person who can't hold steady. There are supports and resources in the community. Um, the first place I always tell people to call is really if, if you're able to open up, but it's the children's crisis, um, CR, mm -hmm. children's mobile crisis, CR2, and that number is 1-844-627-4747. They will come to the home. They'll assess the child, the young person. One caveat is the young person has to want to be served. Um, mm -hmm. and they can voluntarily say, I don't want that. Um, that's a whole different thing. So. Um, as long as they're, they want the help and they're seeking that help, that's a good starting place. Um, and they can direct if that needs to be more urgent or, you know, that can, you know, call our intake line, which is also on there for our office and the children's behavioral health. So, so thank you very much, Jacob. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn us, as you have definitely done a couple of times, I'm going to turn us over to, to Melanie. Madeline, geez, excuse me. <laughs> I tend to rename people. Just ask Mariana how many times I've named her different things. Um, <laughs> so Madeline Holden, let's tell you, let, let me tell you a little bit about her. She's a graduate student with George Mason University in her Master's of Social Work program. Her current learning practicum is with the Arlington County Healthy Living Program, which is awesome. Uh, her, uh, the Healthy Living Program provides a range of wellness opportunities to community members who are in recovery from mental health or substance use challenges. Um, she's working with, I'm pointing, but Mariana Cardozo is, is a person she's working with who runs that program. So if you have questions, please throw those in here. Self-care, this is something that Madeline wrote. Self-care is an evolving process that changes during each season of life. She considers herself 
fortunate to have opportunities to explore this topic in the classroom through internships and of course personal experiences and she's excited to share some useful resources. Some of her favorite, favorite self-care habits include connecting with friends and family, spending time outdoors, and practicing yoga at home. She looks forward to hearing any of your ideas as well. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up her presentation and Natalie, take it away. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so, goodness gracious, I just named you <laughs> yes, again. My name is Madeline. <laughs> thank you. Um, so yes, I would like to hear everyone's ideas. Um, there are going to be a couple of times in the presentation um, where I ask for participation through either the chat or um, just going off mic and chiming in. Um, I think self-care is something that we can all learn from each other for sure. Um, so I wanted to talk about self-care specifically during the holidays as this tends to be a busy season of life, right? Whether you're formally celebrating or not, we all have breaks from school and work coming up, um, just changes in our regular routine. And we're also thinking about a new year and what that might mean. So it's a good opportunity to reflect about self-care. If you could, thank you. Awesome. Um, so here we have our eight dimensions of wellness model. Um, and this is just a helpful visual thinking about everything that goes into wellness, not just our physical health. Um, maybe when we hear wellness, we think exercise or a diet, um, but it's really all of these things. And when we're thinking about self-care, this might be a good place to start thinking about our needs or some areas we might want to make some changes. Okay. Um, so stress is our normal response to changes in our environment. Um, it's an unavoidable part of life, and it can be very helpful uh, when meeting short-term challenges. But when we have chronic stress, it can cause some problems for us physically, mentally, emotionally, um, as well as lead us to uh, adopt some potentially not very helpful behaviors, right? Coping with um, stress. So COVID-19, um, as Jacob has, you know, had illustrated, it's been this huge kind of collective stressor as society. And in so many ways, we've been really adaptable and resilient, so much so that I don't even think we realize how much we've had to adapt because we haven't even had a chance to process it. Um, but it is going on and I think it, it impacts us all a lot, sometimes more than we realize. So we're all dealing with a lot of stress. Holidays, while they are really you know, full of joy and celebration, excitement, um, a lot of good things, they can also be sources of stress as well. Thank you. Um, so this is just an attempt at humor <laughs> about coping with holiday stress. Um, so why are holidays challenging? Well, holidays tend to occur around changes in routine. So whenever there's a sudden change in routine, it kind of could potentially pose some challenges for us. Um, there could be demands on time and energy, also unrealistic expectations. So we may feel like we need to be happy all the time or things need to be perfect, um, but that's, that's not realistic. Um, issues with relationships might come to light or might see financial challenges, and it can just be emotionally overwhelming. A lot of times holidays, they might bring all sorts of emotions and not all of them are about like I said, kind of being happy or festive. Um, it might bring up kind of challenging things. We might have memories of loved ones that we've lost. Um, some really intense emotions can come up around the holidays too. So how can we have a more balanced approach? So we can acknowledge the full range of feelings and emotions that we have, um, not just maybe the more positive ones, as well as discussing concerns with family and friends and mental health care providers. Um, we can set spending limits, ask for help, share responsibilities for things like meals um, or hosting guests, and just be honest about what we feel like we can take on. Um, and focusing on activities that bring joy and meaning to you and your family, which might mean saying no to things, um, and trying not to compare ourselves to others or even ourselves in previous years. And it's okay if things look different this year. Um, we can also incorporate self-care into our routine and holiday traditions. Okay, so what is self-care and why is it important? So I would love to hear um, some feedback from the audience if you wanna put it in the chat or um, 
say out loud, but uh, what is self-care and why is it important? This is your personal definition. And that's okay if we can just pause a moment, um, but we can move on too. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have a couple things in the chat. Thank you for sharing. Um, Mariana, uh, doing the baseline things that help me feel steady. Um, Jacob, taking time for myself to process the day or week. Yeah, those are both great. Being nice to ourselves, like that one. Awesome. Thanks everyone for participating. Yeah, okay, that's, that's a good point too. Um, being a single parent, doing what you need to do to maintain yourself, um, partly so you can also support your family. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, my slides are like being a little bit blocked. Is that, is anyone else seeing that? Oh, perfect, thank you. Okay, so yes, yeah, self-care can mean many different things. Um, it can be about engaging in activities that promote our wellness uh, while reducing stress and burnout, uh, prioritizing our needs as valid and important. Sometimes we're um, much better at taking care of others sometimes than ourselves. Thinking about practices that help us live more meaningfully and joyfully. And when we take good care of ourselves, we're better able to take care of our loved ones. And self-care is not always an individual activity. It can also be something that we do with each other. Um, and it can be both responsive and proactive. So when we're experiencing stress, we may want to reflect on our self-care practices, but we can also build self-care practices and habits when, like during times of calm so that we have that foundation because it can be really hard to try something new um, when you're in a state of stress. Okay, so um, a little bit more participation, um, but I'm curious if anyone has any self-care tips or ideas about things they do on their own or with their family. I'm thinking we can kind of learn from each other for this one. Um, so one thing that I've discovered, oh, and Andrea has some. Um, Slowing down and having a meal together. Yeah. Uh, crochet, going to the gym, walking your dog, listening to affirmations, getting outside, going to the gym, cooking dinner, gaming. Yeah, I like these a lot. Yeah, I think going outside has been really important, especially with so many virtual things this year. Yeah. Okay, so this is just a graphic, uh, 50 ways to take a break, and it'll be um, shared as a link uh, if you wanna look at it again. I think it's kind of um, inspirational and they're kind of silly things, but you know, buying flowers, um, petting a furry creature, eating a meal in silence. So kind of just some different ideas to change your perspective from where you are. So we had 50 ways to take a break. Um, and this is just a more simplified approach thinking about just four. So the four M's, which are movement, mindfulness, mastery, and meaningful connection. So our first M, uh, movement. So movement is about finding activities that you enjoy. It's a chance to give your brain a break and break up sitting um, or screen time, which we all do a lot of might look like stretching, yoga, walking, running, biking, or playing a sport. Um, could be something you do outdoors or indoors. And I think as a family, maybe around the holidays, going for a walk in your neighborhood or checking out an Arlington trail or park, 
Um, you could also be on the lookout for festive lights and decorations. I think that could be a really great way to bring that into your holiday tradition. Um, okay, and we have mindfulness. So mindfulness is about being in the present moment, observing our thoughts without judgment and cultivating acceptance. Um, so this could look like guided meditation and deep breathing exercises. Um, I actually have some links to YouTube videos for those on the resource sheet, but there's a ton of stuff online if you haven't done this before. And it can be really helpful. And often these exercises are very quick. Um, also being just being present with family and focusing on doing one thing at a time. Um, and there is mindfulness can really be integrated throughout your um, daily routine. So you have a quick video that shows some examples of that. Hello and welcome back to the Mindful Kind video blog. My name is Rachel Cable and today I'm going to be sharing a meaningful mindfulness routine for beginners. So feel free to use these practices at any time of the day. I'm just going to be sharing a really rough itinerary that you can follow if you would like to. So the first practice is at 7 a.m. when you first wake up, try to do a breathing practice. For example, the breathing waltz is a really great and easy one to remember. Just breathe in for three counts, hold for three counts and breathe out for three counts. And then just repeat as many times as you would like to. The second mindfulness practice is to have a mindful drink at 9 a.m. So I personally love to have a mindful cup of coffee. I go and sit down on the couch and I get my dog Moose and we just sit there and have a cuddle and I enjoy all the flavors and the temperature and the texture of my coffee. But feel free to do this with any kind of drink that you would like. At 10 a.m. it might be a really nice time to do a mindful stretch because if you've already been working or spending some time on the couch or at a computer, you might already be getting a little bit tense in your shoulders and neck. So do just a really simple stretch. You can just roll your shoulders, roll your neck. If you have a little bit of time, maybe you could do a short yin yoga practice, anything that helps you feel a little bit less tense and a bit more stretched out and relaxed. At 11 a.m., see if you can connect with nature. So you could keep a flower nearby and you can appreciate the colors and the way that it looks, or you could have a look at the sky and watch the clouds for a little bit, or go out to a garden or go for a walk. Just see if you can spend a little bit of time in nature and actually appreciating it. At 1 p.m., try to tune in to your senses. So you can play the senses game, which I shared on a different episode of the Mindful Kind video blog, or simply notice five things you can feel, five things you can see, and five things that you can hear. At 2 p.m. see if you can have something to eat a little bit mindfully. You can enjoy the flavors and the sensations. Notice how your body feels as you eat. Actually pay attention to the feeling of hunger and the satisfaction. At 4 p.m. acknowledge something that you're feeling without judging that feeling. Maybe you've had a long day and you're feeling really tired or bored or maybe you've just got home and you feel relieved to have the rest of the night to unwind or you're feeling really content or happy. Just notice something that you're feeling. At 7 p.m., wash the dishes mindfully. So you can do this by paying attention to the warmth of the water, maybe the smell of the soap, the feeling as your hands grab different dishes and the movements, the circular motions and placing them on the dish rack to dry. At 8 p.m., it is time for a mindful hug, whether it be yourself or someone else or a pet. See if you can feel into that comforting sensation and the warmth of the hug. Actually notice how it makes your body feel. At 9 p.m., see if you can take a little bit of time to write in a journal. I will share another video where I reviewed some journals in the show notes below, but something really simple that you can do is just write down five things that you're grateful for right now. And at 10 p.m., just before you're about to go to sleep, See if you can do a body scan either from the tips of your toes all the way up through your body or from the top of your head all the way down. Something that I like to do which makes body scanning a little bit easier is to actually imagine a really soft cloth just kind of massaging each little part of my body. I just find that it feels really soothing and it keeps my attention in the moment much better. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed learning about the meaningful mindfulness routine for beginners. If you would like to learn more and download an infographic of all of the practices and the times, then click the link in the show notes to go over to my website and check it out.
Apologies, that transition didn't go the way I wanted it to. So it may, that video may seem, because there are so many things, it might seem overwhelming if you're thinking, oh, I can't do that all in one day. I think if you just picked one of those things and tried it, it could make a big difference. Thank you. So you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. Um, and I think that's kind of a embodies the sort of mindfulness attitude of not trying to change things, but learning how to accept um, and kind of go with the flow to the best that we can. And self-care and mindfulness can help us kind of ride the waves, so to speak. Uh, meaningful connection. Uh, so this is our, our third M. So meaningful connection just kind of recognizes the social dimension of wellness back to that big circle we looked at at the beginning with all eight dimensions. Um, but self-care is not just an individual task, right? It can be really effective when we practice with others, with our family members or friends. Um, and it's recognizing how important relationships are to our wellness. This might look like conversations at the dinner table or playing a board game. Uh, maybe the holiday season is a kind of good reason to remind you to reach out to people that you haven't kept up with. Could be writing holiday cards, um, checking in with extended family. Um, you may have some extra time to do things like baking together, looking at photographs and sharing family stories. Um, and the last M here is mastery. So mastery is um, basically, it's kind of a way of um, building in a sense of accomplishment into our day. So it's intentional efforts towards different projects. It could be school, work, or a hobby, um, and giving yourself credit for accomplishing a task. So something simple like making your bed or folding laundry, or more complex, like practicing a musical instrument, um, completing a scrapbook. So we think about this as something we could do together, maybe baking and decorating uh, cookies or decorating a space in our house for the holidays, uh, working together to build a puzzle, those sorts of things. So a lot of the activities that we might do for self-care, it might have more than one of the M's. So a meaningful connection can occur whenever we're with others um, and we can bring a mindful approach throughout our day. Um, Another fun way to think about movement and meaningful connection could be walking with a friend or um, taking a telewalk. Uh, so you could be catching up with a friend, you know, while on the move. And we have a lot of schedule changes that happen with winter break coming up. So, you know, when, when that happens, it can be nice because we're getting a break. It'll be a, you know, potentially like a vacation. We get to do some extra things that we wouldn't normally, um, but, it can be nice to try to keep some things um, stable with our routine. So thinking about sleeping and meals, um, that would be a good, good way to start. Um, coping ahead is also something that can be really useful. So when we talk about self-care as being sort of proactive or preventative, the idea of like, we can kind of anticipate maybe what's caused us stress in the past or, and or what we're worried about. And maybe we can come up with a strategy to cope, um, have some good self-care um, plans ready or have some people we can reach out to, um, but just to kind of plan ahead of time. And of course, being kind to yourself, um, that's very important. Um, and remembering, yeah, yeah, just to be kind to yourself, self-care might look different every day. So you may not be able to, um, you know, keep up the same routine because every day is different in terms of energy levels or what's going on with your family. Um, and just being flexible with that. So uh, self-care is not a skill we master or a puzzle we solve, um, but rather an ongoing practice we experience each day. Um, so every day we kind of see, see what's in front of us and work with that. Um, so if people have something to write with, um, or if you could please take that out, we are gonna do a couple um, questions as well as our self-care plan. So it'd be helpful if you can write, write some things down. Um, first, just thinking about 
what are some ways that you practice self-care? Um, listing three of your existing self-care practices. And then um, step two is listing three self-care practices you'd like to try. Um, and these can be for yourself or something you would do with your family. And it might be holiday related or not, um, but hopefully you've gotten some ideas throughout the presentation of things you could add in. Okay, so now um, thinking about those that things that you listed in step two, things you wanted to try, um, pick one of those and think about what are the steps that are needed to make this happen. So if you were interested in trying yoga, for example, maybe you need to find a yoga mat or maybe you need to make a space, you know, in your basement where you could do that. There's some examples. Um, and then once you've thought that through, uh, step four is just once one small step you can do this week. Awesome. So how can that exercise be helpful? So part of it is giving yourself credit for the self-care that you already practice. And it's a good way to remind yourself of what those things are. And if you're feeling stressed or overwhelmed, you already have some proven things that work and that you know how to do. Um, it's also a chance to be creative and brainstorm. So I'm thinking of that, you know, 50 ways to take a break, right? But maybe thinking of something fun or interesting that you could bring into your routine. Um, and it's a place to grow from. So maybe that model can be something that you revisit in the future and um, you can add in some new self-care practices that you wanna try. Um, so some challenges for after the presentation, um, having a family conversation about self-care. I'm not sure how often that term really comes up in, in conversation. Um, so maybe just being really candid and asking, you know, what they think about self-care or how do they relax and those sorts of questions um, and just being really direct about it, because I think that a lot of people are experiencing stress um, and they may not discuss it openly. So it's a good opportunity, um, especially with the holidays and with winter break coming. Um, you can share the self-care plan that you created tonight if you'd like and build on it together. Um, maybe creating some sort of visual display. So putting something, whether it's the self-care plan or um, some other poster, putting something on your fridge that has some ideas to look at. Um, adding it to your calendar. So this time next week, if you wanna put a little star in your calendar and revisit your self-care plan and kind of see where you are um, and see how that's been going, I think that'd be very helpful. Um, and we have a resource page that we'll send out that has some resources um, specific to Arlington, as well as just some online resources that can be helpful for thinking about self-care. Um, and that's it. I don't know if anyone has any comments or questions. But... How often should you self-care? Once a week, once a month? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know if there's a magic number. Um, I think, <laughs> I mean, I guess it's- You know, I just, it just yeah. crossed my mind. Yeah. It does balance you if you do yeah. it uh, at least once a week. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, do you have something that you, that you do already that you feel comfortable sharing? 
I mean, going to get a pedicure, going to get uh, uh, a facial, going to get your hair done. That's self-care. Yeah, definitely. Going to the gym. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be different for everyone. And I think the nice thing about thinking about it with the family too, right, is maybe that's part of your regular, like if you could be doing things as a family all the time. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it can be really little things, right? Like doing some deep breathing. I mean, yeah, I think every day is my, my answer, but you know, I don't just some type of self-care, but again, I don't think it's like a, a magic number. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that, but I think, it, yeah, incorporating it into your routine regularly is good. So um, if someone in the chat saying as much as possible, like even if it's just having a cup of tea, um, other people saying, yeah, sometimes mul multiple types a day. Um, and just like having lots of different types of self-care. So as you said, like kind of getting your nails done or something, yeah, that's not going to be every day, right? But maybe having a cup of tea in the afternoon, maybe that becomes a daily routine that's important for you. So I think having like a ton of different things is really good. Well, thank you, Madeline, for sharing all that. Um, for those that didn't check out the chat because the resource list that she referenced and then that 50 ways to take a break is also in there. So as you talk about different types of health care, there's a 50 of them. So uh, thank you so much, Madeline. Thank you both Jacob and Madeline for sharing your time and some of your experiences and bringing that in and putting it out here in the community. Um, as someone who lives and works in Arlington, I appreciate this for for me, for my neighbors, and for all of us here tonight. So I also want to thank everyone else who came to join us tonight, taking the time out to be with us. This is something we try to do on a monthly basis. Um, you're on our <laughs> you're on our mailing list, I think. If not, you are certainly on now. So we'll put out notices when we have things coming up. And if there are ever any topics or things that would appeal to you, send us a note. Um, by all means, dhsprevention at arlingtonva.us. I'll put that in the chat. Um, but at this point, I think I don't have anything else to say except thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. Jacob again, Madeline again, whose name I finally got right. And to everyone else for being here, Courtney, for also being in there for with the chat. And then to the folks that are also mentoring these two young folks, Natalie and Mariana. Have a wonderful evening. Wish you the best through these holidays. And next year will be better, won't it, Jacob? Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Awesome. So we'll say good night here. Um, Presenters, if you want to go ahead and hang on, we can do a quick debrief. We'll say good night to everyone. Thank else you, here. everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank Have you. a great night. There we go. Just us. Um, I agree with Natalie. Oh, and then she leaves. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so there was someone named Natalie, so that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of how she does things. She like says her piece, and then she whoop, she got things to do. Yeah. All right. Well, you did beautifully. Um, sorry, Madeline, I back and forth a little bit on your on your slides. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. I mean, that's kind of hard to judge. Um, you know, when someone's gonna pause, but yeah. it really yeah. took so much off me to not have to think about screen sharing and. Okay. Oh man. Yeah, I, I definitely <laughs> I had some uh, run-ins with technology. Oh man, my phone. I, I have all, I had my notes on my phone, and it was in the corner, and it slipped, and it hit the escape button, and it closed my perform. My and I was just I was panicked. I was like, oh great, messed it up. 
<laughs> I didn't because you couldn't tell it all. No. All. <laughs> no. Okay. I definitely felt like I, I stumbled a little bit here and there. Was that heard at all? What? I didn't notice it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because there was a couple of slides. At one point, I, I don't know what happened. I guess maybe when I maybe when I, I went to go open the slides, I must have switched the places of the slides because I I clicked the next slide expecting it to be one thing, and it was another. And I was like, oh, okay. Let's just. Oh no! <laughs> Only you would have known that. We would have yeah. never known. Yeah. <laughs> I was just curious to see if anyone heard me like pause a little bit there. Okay. No. No, it's. I mean, your your pacing and flow was was perfect. Um, I, I have to confess that earlier today, when I looked through all the slides you had, I was like, that's a lot of slide, <laughs> but you both manage it beautifully. You're, you're paid really. Um, yeah, you Madeline, your, your presentation was so smooth and so professional. I'm incredibly impressed. I was in there like, oh man. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it was very, very, like very concise, very, like very to the point and very easy to follow along. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So. No, you both did. Fabulous. And, you know, Courtney and I have seen a number of these things. We've watched people go through these. Mm -hmm. and, you know, most people we do have done these enough times. They know, but there's always slip ups. But um, no, this was this was good. You guys are we'll, we'll have you back anytime. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely good doing a presentation about self care, because if you get really yeah. stressed when you're working on it, you're like, <laughs> it's right I there. have to model <laughs> this. Like, I have to I'm about to. <laughs> It's good. Every time right I was like, I can't, I'm going to be really hypocritical if I let myself get too late. Yeah. <laughs> it's in the title. It's in it the title. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, congratulations and thank you again. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Glad you had this. Glad you had the space. But yeah, I'm I'm grateful to have other voices doing these things and different. Mm -hmm. voices. Um, you know, the younger ones like you guys coming out, you have a very different perspective and experience. So it's it's good to have, you know, old guys like me, um, different, you know, with everyone with their own experiences. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Thanks, awesome. yeah. Thanks again. Sure. So have a great night. And now two weeks off, I heard you both say, right? Sleep. My self care routine <laughs> is just sleep. <laughs> Nothing but sleep. Beautiful. All right. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.